I'm going to move across to kick off the, I, I guess, the, the focus on, um, I guess, what industries are doing at the moment, which ones are challenged, which ones are thriving. I, I think we talked about remote working people um, and all of these challenges. I, I think there's it's a question that comes to my mind and you know, there's been resistance for change for various reasons. Um, and my question is to Phil, uh, Phil Hassey, who's obviously been covering you know, automation and um, you know, software and services research for, for decades, but you know, automation specifically over the last few years. Um, and do you feel, Phil, this is sort of the, um, you know, that, that, that point where, you know, companies will uh, get the epiphany that it, this is the time to actually bring automation into their, into their, into their companies, businesses, into the ecosystem. Um, it, it, I mean, do you have anything to share on that? Yeah, I've been waiting for automation to be standard business practice for years and there's never been the one compelling event to make it happen. Uh, didn't quite think that this was going to be the one compelling event. Hadn't set my sights in this regards, but it, it's it's from a skilled labour point of view, the problems that Audrey mentioned about you know, contact centres and offshore workers and just finding people. It's going to be a lot easier um, to use a bot unfortunately, um, in some respects, because that means people's jobs are involved, um, than it is to use and train up a person. So that's one side of automation. But there's just automation of every process. It shouldn't take 10 or 15 consultants to install you know, a module of an ERP system. It should be able to be done automatically and through automation. So it's about removing labour from it and just increasing the speed and the, the urgency with which organisations can uh, implement their technology changes. It's it's just got to happen because um, in a lot of sectors, transportation, oil and gas, retail, parts of the public sector, there's just not going to be the capital available to invest in human-based solutions. So automation is going to have to come much more to the fore than what um, has happened previously, just from a sheer business process and cost of engagement perspective. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you know, I just want to just want to sort of uh, continue on to on that theme and um, just pass it on to you, Tim, because um, I know you, you you talk about it as well from a uh, you know and and you talk uh, in the past about even simple things like data entry. How do you automate that process to make the whole um, remove the friction from this, this you know initiating a a, a process? So, I mean, do you have any thoughts in continuation what Phil just said? Yeah, look, I think Phil's absolutely on the mark. I think um, well, one of the things that a lot of businesses are finding out at the moment is that their digital strategy is actually a bit broken. That actually their digital strategy relied on people sitting in the office, relied on humans to click this button, to drag and drop this information across, you know, to, to grab that package out of the warehouse and move it somewhere else, right? Um, and, um, you know, despite... You know, we have been automating a lot, right? Conceptually, we're using RPA and some simple machine learning capabilities over the last few years. But I think we're, we're starting to realise how much more we need to automate within our business, right? That, that, you know, that the opportunities are massive. And we're, we're seeing that today, right? That, you know, you know, every process that involves a human sitting in an office or a data centre or, you know, somewhere, someone needing to be physically somewhere is something that we are going to have to start thinking about automating because yes, COVID-19 is bad and it's going to go on for a while, we think, but what will be the next pandemic and the one beyond that, right? We don't know. So the, the, the reality is that we are going to have to automate the, these processes sooner rather than later. So Phil, I'm, I, I completely agree with you that you know, I, I do think that this is the, the, the incentive that organisations need. Right, I, I think it, we're, we are starting to realise that things are more broken than we thought they were. Yeah, and I think what we've proven to ourselves as a society is that we can do things at speed. You know, working from home over a week, educating from home over a weekend. And so I, I think these barriers, you know, a lot of people are talking about how the barriers to obstruction are being reduced now. And I think automation is going to benefit from that because the, the, the ease of engaging in an AI platform versus having large numbers of people programming for weeks on end. It's just, 
just simple data entry, as you mentioned, there's so many applications of well, well, automation across business and technology. Well, just taking the, you know, the, the facts, you know, I, I hate to say it there, but there are still plenty of businesses out there and plenty of managers out there who measure their value and success on the size of their team, right? You know, someone ha has a new initiative, traditionally, what's the first thing you do? Well, you hire people to help you sort that out, right? Now, in this new world where we're all working from home and perhaps the, the size of our team is less important, I, I think you're right. I think the first, you know, the, the, the first initiative is going to be how do we automate this, right? It's not going to be, you know, let's hire teams of people to, to, to do this process for us, right? And, you know, I, I think that uh, that's one of the, you know, a, a really important change going forward. I hope that's the case anyway, because you're right. Like, I look at all these systems and processes where you're going, why does it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to implement an ERP? Hundreds of millions of dollars. That's, quite, that, that's a ridiculous that's a amount of money. But to, that's yeah, and as you say, that's a cheap one, right? Yeah. It can, can get into the billions, right? And you're going, like, like many of the things that we spend a lot of money on, well, you know, need and to be automated. I'm going to question to Dr. Koshik um, uh, Just for the benefit of our users, Koshik is um, a industry veteran. Uh, he used to be um, part of the part of the senior leadership team of one of the largest ERP companies, um, and he was um, he's also a PhD in supply chain. He teaches. He's 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 an adjunct professor at a couple of top universities in Asia, and um, he's also spent uh, you know, 10 plus years in, uh, you know, in a management consulting firm and part of that, he's also been in the CIO's office. So he's kind of seen the world. Um, he's, um, so Koshik, you know, we've talked about it before. You've, you've shared your perspectives as well. When you see, um, you know, ERP, for example, uh, and, and supply chain software, I mean, there's, there's always been focused on making supply chains more efficient. Yeah. Uh, but do you really think there's enough enough happening from what you know Tim and Tim and Phil just talked about. Great. Thanks, Amit, and thanks for a very nice introduction. Uh, so, uh, you know, just uh, talking about extending the ERP team. Uh, yes, uh, Phil, Tim, uh, I have been part of that system where we have been part of ERP implementations which have which run into millions and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. So, uh, can those be automated? Can, can we take them off? Uh, which is happening, right? With a uh, lot of functionality now moving into the software. The companies are reducing their level of customization and more and more cloud-based ERP systems are easier to implement. And earlier where implementation timeframes used to be in number of years, now we talk in number of months, right? So the number of people implementing has reduced. So it's happening. Um, and over time as more and more functionality, and also it's a, a question of mindset. More companies now are ready to work with a standard software rather than you know, wanting that particular field in that particular corner of the screen, uh, which I have personally faced those discussions, right? And had had those discussions. But one thing that we have to, you know, I just want to add on to that. Um, while we think of automation, while we think of making our, uh, you know, uh, less human touch in terms of managing those parts of our businesses, which are uh, kind of, which used to be manual, error prone, and can be automated very nicely. Uh, we have to keep in mind the people dimension. And that's where, uh, Tim, you started off with digital strategy. I think whenever you know, this whole digital strategy is being con conceived, the people part of that digital strategy and the change management part is so, so important because nothing will happen. You, know, you can have the best automated system in place, but unless you have the people to uh, you know, use them the way they are meant to be used, it's not going to give results. Second part of it is in terms of you know the learning from COVID and where things are going in terms of supply chain software and uh, implications from a you know in the future risk management and so on and so forth right. Well, you know I'd like to break down the problem in terms of you know when we say risk management supply chain kind of it looks huge right, but let's think of you know in supply chain uh, what exactly is the supply chain? We are essentially if any company can manage three flows properly. The first is the material flow, which is the flow of products. The second is the financial flow, which is the flow of finance, you know, the cash as products get bought, made, and sold. And the third is the information flow. So where, you know, so any disruptions in supply chain 
uh, means that these three flows are getting disrupted. So now, obviously, from a risk management perspective, we need to think out of these three flows and all of and of all these three flows, where do we have the most control, and which ones can be actively managed, and which ones can do we need to transfer the risk over to someone? Right. That's like risk mitigation 101. So you know, uh, uh, my thought process is that physical flow. It's difficult to manage because now we are working in such a virtualized world where with so many trading partners that you know, depending on the country, depending on the supplier, depending on their status, depending on the orders that they have, uh, physical flow disruptions are very real with disruptions such as COVID or any other calamity. Financial flow is intimately linked with physical flow because financial flow is dependent on the liquidity and you know how much a firm is able to withstand these disruptions in terms of the deep pockets that they have. Right? So that also we have less control on. But where we have the most control on is the information flow. And that is one reason I think the focus on information, managing information flow in supply chains is going to you know, really uh, take off uh, given this uh, scenario. So what do I mean by information flow? And what do I mean by you know, risk management frameworks and processes. So, so you see, uh, uh, and I've mentioned this to in other conversations, if you look at uh, industries such as financial services, telecom, because the level of uh, regulations, level of compliance requirements are so strong that their risk management practices are extremely tight. And they do stress tests, they, you know, kind of make sure that such calamities don't, you know, don't disrupt their uh, operations much. Whereas in supply chain, unless, you know, it's a particular, you know, pharmaceutical, healthcare, some regular industries, you know, typical manufacturing are not that regulated. And that's why risk management is not that germane a term as it is in financial services and telecom and others, right? So uh, what I think is going to happen is that uh, because of this, this has been such a unprecedented and such a global, you know, impact that nobody has been able to prepare for this, right? It's unfair to expect that any supply chain, com any, any company's supply chain have been prepared. So most of them have gone into a crisis management mode. And I've been talking to some of my friends in the, in the industry and, you know, what I hear that uh, initial days, February, March, was in a major crisis management mode. And what is crisis management mode? Where, you know, in a, any supply chain or in any, uh, any other value chain, uh, in order to manage risks, you have to make sure that all the functions are coming together to take a decision so that the implications of that decision is understood and agreed by all. So if I'm taking a decision of uh, taking from a supplier from Belgium rather than China, the implications in terms of cost, implications in finance, implications in terms of customer satisfaction, all that has to be linked. So you need to bring a, you know, a set of functions to it. But that can happen only in war room conditions. Now that we are getting into the new normal, we cannot have that, right? So how can we bring in that level of communication across functions, that level of information integration across functions internally as well as with trading for part? And that's where technology is going to play a huge role. Because one thing that's going to happen surely is that our planning cycles will start uh, you know, uh, becoming more frequent. Even today in the best of firms, and I'm talking of the best of supply chain firms, the only planning cycle that brings all functions of an enterprise together are the integrated business planning and sales and operations planning process, which is a monthly planning cycle. And in the new normal, we can't possibly run with such monthly planning cycles. So, which means the planning cycles would have to be fortnightly or weekly. What does that mean? That means that the information that we needed to run our monthly planning cycles need to be gathered and verified and used in our weekly and fortnightly planning cycles, which is which leads to our you know a complete you know uh, different level of requirements in terms of the visibility of inventory, visibility of our supplies, visibility of customer orders, the planning uh, data, and so on and so forth. And that is where I think uh, one of the biggest contribution that automation and visibility can make when it comes to technology in managing risk. 
So I'll stop here and you know, this, is, this must be a topic others would like to contribute to. Oh, thanks, Kaushik. And since I'm, on, since I'm sticking to PhDs at the moment, I might pass that on to Aliyah. Dr. Leo, I was just going to say, uh, well, from what, we, we, we've been comparing notes actually in terms of what we both yeah. teach, but I'm going to actually going to take it from a different angle. We have right now, I mentioned agility before, I'm seeing a lot of disintermediation where the companies are saying, okay, I was making 75% of my, my products for the industrial commercial world and only 25% for the consumer world. And all of a sudden we're all at home. This is why the toilet paper hoarding occurred. And then we went through the whole, how do we cut our hair at home? A discussion we've all had previously here as well. Uh, how do I color my hair at home? Uh, and the next thing that's happening on in terms of how do I stock my home laptop, my new light rings, my green screens. I see lots of my colleagues. This is all going directly from the manufacturer or a major uh, hub because we can't go to stores at the moment. So the stores are losing and the manufacturers are saying, hang on a second, it's a wake up call. I no longer have control of the data about my customers. I've handed that over to the channel and now I, I can't even use that channel. So let me rethink, can I go directly to the customer? So I'm seeing a lot of really cool business models right now where wholesalers are saying, okay, I can't go to the market anymore. So I'm going to offer that 25 kilo salmon, I'm being sort of exaggerating, to a consumer. And my brother-in-law is on, at one o'clock in the morning going around wholesaler sites to see what kinds of fish he can buy. And he's taking fish with a hacksaw and putting it in his freezer, but people are going direct. I was giving an example of Heinz at home in the UK. Heinz is selling cases of baked beans and tomato sauce directly to consumers. Okay, so what would normally go through a certain set of complex channels you're talking about and planning, that's disappearing. And now Heinz has a much better insight as to who really are their consumers. But here's the kicker. Can they deal with that data? They're going to get volumes and volumes of data they've never seen before. Uh, how are they going to use it? work with it, uh, GDPR, protect it, uh, privacy, you know, who's consuming beans and who might have, you know, there's going to be lots of, of issues around this. So we're going to see new supply chains and a lot of agility involved that they can now pivot quickly if they have to. So whatever the next pandemic is or whatever the next scenario is, perhaps using your term constant war room, you know, all of a sudden now where are we? Now what do we have to do? Now we have to make toilet paper in different form factors. Okay, how fast can we change that? It's not that difficult to make toilet paper, by the way. I'm not doing it at home, I'm just saying. But, you know, those large rolls you have in an industrial setting don't work at home. They have to quickly change the form factor around. It's doable to change form factors. We're seeing a number of good uh, companies changing, like McLaren is changing from making race cars to making carts for ventilators. It's not that challenging if you put your mind to it in these really quick resets to be agile, but that's going to have to be baked into the corporate DNA. How do you become agile? And that's going to be more, again, what technologies, tools, processes do I have to invest in now? You're thinking invest. This is not a good moment to talk about invest, but it's true. We're going to have to invest to move forward. Where do we do those investments? Yeah. You know, with that, um, I've got a question for Niloy, uh, Niloy Mukherjee, who's, um, so Niloy is, um, just a quick introduction to Niloy, um, for, I guess for the users, for the benefit of the users. We, um, so Niloy comes with um, exceptional leadership experience in the hardware and infrastructure uh, technology space in, in leadership roles and strategy and marketing, um, and has also worked with uh, McKinsey um, uh, for some time as a, a leadership consultant. So, but I guess the question I have for you Niloy is, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, we've talked about automation, the software, we've talked about, um, we've talked a little bit about infrastructure, uh, but I'd love to understand what's going on with, you know, the endpoint of the digital value chain, because the endpoint eventually is either in our palms or on our desks, right? It's devices um, that keep us connected or devices that we use. Um, and we know that there's, there's a whole bunch of supply chain disruption there. And, um, and what, what are the implications you're seeing uh, for that industry? for the devices industry. Right. Thanks, Amit. So uh, you, from a supply chain perspective, okay, so the interesting thing was that, you know, even before COVID came, uh, I was talking to uh, a lot of the uh, leaders there uh, in, in this the back half of last year. And um, with all the 
drama going on with the U.S. government and you know sanctions on China now on now off now on now off. Those uh, the that supply chain has already been under a lot of stress because there's been a lot of uncertainty. And now what's happened is just kind of you know increased it tenfold. And I think the big thing with the supply chain in uh, the supply chain for hardware is uh, most of that stuff is made out of China. Almost like I think now very little is done anywhere else. And the big issue is the ecosystem around it, right? So you don't make hardware in China because um, you know it's the cheapest place. It's actually not that different from let's say Malaysia. But um, the big issue is that all the supplier base, everything is there. The whole ecosystem of getting everything together is there. So if you try to break that and do it elsewhere, it becomes much more expensive. All the development work now has slowly started shifting there. Right? So development is uh, for hardware is basically two areas, right? Taiwan and uh, and China. And China now with Shenzhen is really you know expanding. That. So now everyone's having to think: okay, this is not working. There's disruption, and we have not thought about risk management of having all eggs in one basket. So they're thinking of other places. I am not sure that you know. I mean, if COVID goes on for a year, then sure things will change. I'm optimistic it won't happen. So. If it goes away in a couple of months, we may just go back to business as usual after a little bit of noise here there. But what may also happen is there is going to be definitely a you know slum thinking about diversifying, and that could benefit countries like Malaysia, Thailand, and a lot of the countries in our backyard a lot. Out in my mind, but you know you could also have Vietnam benefiting uh, and a few other countries. Right? Definitely, you know there is there's going to be a move to diversify a bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. Things that I want to cover, I want to talk about, um, you know, we talk about people, impact, automation, technology, industries, how they're coping with it. But um, I guess the underlying theme is that um, customer behavior is going to change tremendously, uh, both in terms of how we, how we are living our lifestyles, how we want to consume. But also the reality is that um, people may have less disposable income in the short to midterm to, um, uh, to spend on certain things, right? Question for Phil. Um, I think it's, you know, we, we, we're hearing this mantra at the moment, survive to thrive. Yeah. And we know that customer behavior is going to change, but it's also a time when companies are really starting to tighten their belt and they have to look at the dollars and, and cents. Yeah. Do you, um, I mean, do you have, do you have a view on or concern about the fact that there may be, um, there may be a disconnect where the CFO takes over? The, that, that piece and starts to drive those strings and everything linking to that and customer experience falls under that bucket as opposed to the way it should be or the way we'd like it to be or the way Tim, Tim Sheedy wants customer experience to be driven. I mean, you know, Tim is a proponent of best practice around that. So, um, I mean, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I, I, I've had concerns that um, CFA is probably not my favorite role in the organization. Um, anyone who's dealt with them over the years probably understands why. Um, yeah, they like to cut back and they like to, um, you know, just see things in a narrow frame. And, and my fear at the moment is um, as organisations are stuck for capital, don't know who their customers are, where their customers are going to be uh, in the future, they're going to go, CFO is going to go, we're not going to spend $20 million on the customer experience investment. We're only going to spend $2 million on that. Go and run away with $2 million and that's more than I was going to give you anyhow. And I think the big fear is that just... Um, that crunch of organisations being led by the quarterly cycle of the stock market for many listed organisations or being led by a CFO approach of cutting money to, to make money um, is going to be a real issue for customer experience. You, you can't take that attitude. You've got to look at it, spend money to make money as an investment in customer experience rather than a cut money to make money uh, for customer experience. So my big fear is that the CFOs will... Um, you know, just see it from a financial transactional point of view and go, well, we don't have the capital, so we're not going to spend. And that's that's a big risk for customer experience, for customers. It's a big risk for the organisational ecosystem, their suppliers, their partners, their, you know, their um, agencies or however their distribution model works. So I just think it's a real fear, fear that CFOs are going to take a CFO view on the world and not a broader 
CXO view that customer experience is absolutely central to how to drive forward out of financial stress. Yeah. And the other thing is that what's driving the, um, you know, what's driven a lot of the changes in customer experience over the, over the last 10 years have been the startups and the smaller and mid-sized firms, right? And, you know, and, and, and the big ones have generally been laggards. Now, we know, you know, economically that it is the small and mid-sized firms that are hurting the most at the moment. They are the ones that are not just hurting, many of them are, are closing their doors at the moment. So, therefore, you know, adding to your point, Phil, you know, let's look at the fact that perhaps there is actually less competitive pressure, you know, in, in terms of improving that customer experience. Um, you know, there, there probably is some truth in what you're saying there, that you know, without those people nipping at their heels as, as, as much as they used to, and look, they'll be back, it just takes a while for them to, for them to come back. Um, you know, then, then maybe there will be less pressure to, to, to spend on that customer experience and, you know, more focus on betting down the, the, the profit um, and, and the budget. Yeah. It, yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, Audrey, do you have, uh, Audrey Williams, uh, the expert on uh, customer experience, Audrey, do you have a view on that? What Tim and Phil just talked about and... Sorry, maybe I can talk about this uh, more from, I guess, how I see the decision making changing from what, you know, Phil mentioned and even just from our research um, and just talking to um, just, you know, big, you know, stakeholders out there. Um, it, it's clearly shifting, um, you know, across the organization, Amit, is what I'm seeing uh, in terms of how organizations are viewing customer experience and it's no longer in those siloed departments. And I think uh, there's going to be a big proponent where uh, it's not just going to be the CEO, CEO and board um, or CFO, uh, but the, but I think chief happiness officer, like I heard um, a couple of weeks ago, um, are titles that more and more companies are dealing with. Um, so I think it's going to be customer experience now is something that um, boards and direct uh, boards and CEOs are taking very seriously, but it's now going across the entire organization. And even in ecosystems research, um, our CX research, that has come out really strongly. Oh, thank you for that. And you know, with that, I'm going to take this question to Shamir. Do you feel that this is an opportunity for Telco Shamir to seize the moment and change the way they approach customer experience and really focus on aligning offerings to um, what users actually want to consume rather than um, just putting some structured plans that they think that, that people would want to buy. Yeah, I think clearly, you know, it's um, something that is very important. I don't think anyone has rated telcos as having very high customer experience at all. Um, but clearly also, you know, the fact that the channels to market are being depressed, and you know, the digital economy has probably got a shot in the arm. Underlying all of that is the services that the telcos offer. So uh, there's much, much more reliability uh, on them, on our day-to-day -day lives, both in a social and business sense. And, um, um, you know, obviously they have to make sure that, you know, they, they, they improve in this area in a big way. Great. Um, one, one question, just finally on the customer experience space, um, I want to I throw this question to... Um, um, Chris White, Chris, who's um, a head of marketing, but also um, drives our, our community engagement with, um, I guess, users across whether they're in the vendor landscape or stakeholders from the technology buyer landscape. Um, Chris, I know you gave us a um, rundown on you know some of the things that um, you know businesses should be doing from a marketing standpoint, a customer engagement standpoint in this current time. What is important? What are some of the do's and don'ts? I mean, do you want to share some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's fairly straightforward. I think, you know, we've all seen ourselves in, in how we're interacting with, um, uh, you know, the people that we're buying our services from. We're not so open ourselves to people trying to sell us things right now because, you know, m money is tight. So we don't want people trying to, you know, shove a product down our throat that we don't necessarily want. Um, you know, we know what we want. We'll go out and research it and we'll buy it. And, and there's a very similar um, you know, uh, correlation to that on the, the, um, the industry side as well. So um, 
we're, what, um, what we've been seeing or what the research has come out is that there's a lot more activity from salespeople at this moment in time. There's a lot more emails that are being sent out in order to try and um, to, to get business for their organization. But at the same time, people are, uh, people are so focused on what they need right now to get through the current challenges that they're not receptive to, um, to people trying to sell them something that, to be frank, they probably don't need um, or they're not interested in right now. So the engagement with um, salespeople is down a lot lower, even though the activity from salespeople is, is much higher um, than it was previously. Um, but then what that means on the flip side of that is that people are really searching for information to, um, to overcome the challenges that they're, they're currently facing in their organization. So what that then means is that there's a lot more um, inbound traffic to, to websites. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing that ourselves. So educational pieces around um, blogs and content. Um, so people are actively searching for things that are going to help them to overcome the challenges that they're facing right now. Um, and, and there will be more inbound leads for, um, for specific services that help organizations with their current challenges. So, you know, for anyone that has um, solutions that are highly relevant in this moment in time, and obviously someone like, you know, Zoom, for example, we know that they're seeing a lot more business right now, and that's evident in their share price as well. So, so people have re really know what they want at this moment in time. So it's, it's quite difficult for a salesperson right now to, to get new business. Um, people are really trying to overcome their current challenges. So, so engaging with your current customer base, um, you know, working with them, and to help them to overcome their challenges, even if you're not selling them something, but educating them and helping them through what they're currently facing is what's going to set you up better in the future because um, you're going to build that, that goodwill and that reciprocity in the future. So that's generally what you know, we're seeing from, from the, the sales and marketing functions right now. I'll try and wrap it up. I think there was, there was one question that I wanted to pose, both, both um, I guess to, to Phil and to, um, uh, to Neloy, do you think this is a time when um, specifically for, I guess, the partners, channel partners and for customers, especially customers and in industries that are really heavily impacted, if they want to help those customers adopt, transform and take those technologies, do you, is there an opportunity for some of the larger vendors to make a more focused, concerted play um, in that? in that segment of uh, financial services. Absolutely. Um, what got so many disputes and partners through the GFC was uh, finance for vendors. And this is even more critical than the GFC for most, most markets, most companies. So I think they're absolutely critical. And as you said, selling their own products, nowadays they don't just sell their own product. They'll actually sell competing products as well. So it gives them a real interesting position to be a, a lender of choice when Bank lending may be difficult if you're a high stress industry, retail, transportation, oil and gas. Um, it, it just opens up that opportunity to build relationships, but just keep product moving and keep technology investment happening. And I, I, I think it's essential. And, and given the success that it showed in the GFC and uh, the Asian financial crisis before that in our region, it, it's, it's a, a really working model. It's really going to work really well. Great. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, what I'd add to that is, uh, look, I think the vendors want to do more financial services. It's an, like you said, it's a great model, right? And it's additional margins for them. So I think they want to do it. Uh, they'll have to figure out how to get it to smaller customers. That's always been that they can sell it to the large customer, uh, but they are risk averse when it goes to smaller customers. Can they work with channel to do that? Sure. I mean, the, the, there are all those options, which I think they really need to think about. Um, on the channel side, I think the other thing which I'm seeing is, uh, you know, channels were already automating, right? I mean, in the sense, not automating, sorry. They were all already starting to do more of an online presence. So there's very few channels today who don't also have something online. I think they're going much harder there now. And that whole distinction between the brick and mortar kind of channel and the uh, e-commerce kind of channel is going to become even more blended, more... Uh, uh, diffused, and you're going to see a lot more channels now saying, you know, they're online. There's a big opportunity there, by the way, because sometimes the channels push back and resist you being able to offer everything online. And when offering it themselves, that resistance is going to crumble, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So, you know, 
what looks like that the recovery will definitely not be a V-shaped recovery, right? So we will not recover in a band. It will be a long U or maybe a kind of a very long L even. It might have a so, W. It might have a W, who knows, yeah, absolutely. It might be a W, but a kind of a rounded W. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, you know, thing that comes to my mind is that, you know, finally there will be a new normal in whatever form and talked about maybe appearing there. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that our response to what would be a new normal in terms of what we think today has been a disaster recovery response. And that is not sustainable. So if there has to be a new normal, you know, organizations have to prepare for that new normal in all aspects of the enterprise and across all industries. So while we are going through a curved W or a long U, the downtime is a really, really useful time to think through, strategize and put in, you know, mechanisms so that when that new normal emerges, we are ready for that. And those who will be ready for that will be the ones who will survive in the long run. And can I add something here from the healthcare perspective as well? So they are being disrupted completely. They have had no time to prepare and the new normal is on them already. Uh, so the biggest risk that they will have is actually, you know, sitting back and looking at all the investments that they need to make in another year or one and a half years time. They won't have the resources. And, you know, to Koshik's point, you know, how you said that healthcare have, uh, tend to have a very well-developed supply chain. But the fact is, uh, two months back, I was um, looking for blood for my father-in-law in Calcutta. And I spent two days and I couldn't find the right blood group, right? So the supply chain was always kind of disrupted. And there was no cross-agency collaboration across many countries. So that's the other thing. When we think about other industries, I think you know, we need to think that you know, the healthcare industry will be really badly hit in many ways, and uh, that will impact every one of us, not just from the industry point. Yeah. I would, I would can like I, to can I just add? Yeah. Should I go, Audrey? Please first, yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, say, I think the contact center industry is already, they've been pressured and pushed, and they're already sort of like living the new normal. Uh, with, you know, their agents at home. Uh, but what I think they, they wish they had done a lot more was with the high inbound activity and calls that they're receiving right now, they wish that they had thought a lot about innovating around a lot of the non-voice channels, or, uh, a lot around uh, what we spoke about earlier around automation, which Phil mentioned, uh, bots. And I think conversational AI platforms, for example, are really going to um, rise after this. So I think um, they are in that tough position right now. Uh, they wish they had done a lot of things because if not, that would have reduced the load on the contact center. Uh, so we're just going to see a string of innovation uh, from, from the various pockets. And this include you know, FAQs, virtual assistants, conversational AI platforms, and so on. Charlie Lee? Yeah, one, one thing that I just wanted to, when we talk about V-shape or W-shape, or there might be two Ws, um, a little bit of an up and down, but I think also the, the big question would be, what will um, the recovery be, be measured by? Because we had a lot of focus on economic growth. I mean, there's, uh, you see the stock markets have all been on, on all-time highs. But I think now, and back to what Ahmed said at the beginning, um, first and foremost, this is a humanitar humanitarian um, you know, crisis. And I think there's a lot more focus on you know, the personal and the humanitarian aspect. Uh, I spoke to one uh, client yesterday, for example, who um, obviously is in, in, in the same challenging position. But they made a made a point to say, look, every employee from the cleaner through to the executives will stay employed, and we're doing that consciously, um, you know, at, at the cost of probably some profit margins and um, uh, you know potentially um, you know higher budgets, uh, you know, for for recovery. Um, also, we have seen, you know, in New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, um, or before the crisis actually happened last year, said, look, the success of the New Zealand economy or the New Zealand country is not measured by um, economic factors anymore, but by, um, you know, social welfare. So I think the, you know, I think the COVID situation maybe uh, changed the, you know, the measuring point a little bit as well. What do we see as recovery? Is it um, profit margin? Is it... 
uh, you know, stock prices, or is this also, um, you know, some more social aspects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, across different, different, uh, you know, countries and societies? Yeah, I, I agree entirely with that. I was going to sort of finish with a point, you know, a really sort of big point that I, 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 I more of a question than anything, which I, I don't know. I think we're all going to start questioning what is an economy, right? You know, like who knew that our economy was so fragile, right? That a bunch of people start working at home sends us into a near Great Depression style environment, right? Like, and who knew that? I don't think any of us knew how fragile our economies around the world were what world are and that's i think you're right Uli. we're going to start rethinking what is an economy you know, what is a successful economy how do we measure the success uh, of these economies going forward because you know I, I think you know if anything it's shown that the, the measures that we we're using so far um were pretty much off track with you know with humans yeah well the australian government the australian government went for mocking the wellness budget of the uh, Kiwis to basically try and expect to do a wellness budget. Yeah, it, a lot of things have been turned on their head geopolitically and in our institutions. Yeah. Now, look, I think all governments are doing, uh, you know, the hope is that they're all going to do their best. Um, I've also come to a realization that um, in this particular um, crisis scenario, it's no point having a beauty contest between the governments because you never know when the tide turns. And we've seen that happen in certain countries. And the last thing I want to do is jinx anyone. But thank you guys so much for taking the time. I just wanted to, I just wanted to highlight for everyone um, that each of the uh, advisors that uh, were on the call today are going to be either driving uh, certain online sessions with our customers or users or, um, or indus you know, industry leaders that are getting impacted or how they're dealing with it, but also separately on joining me on some of the sessions that uh, I'm running with certain um, leaders as well. 